afternoon, uh, colleagues. Welcome to the July meeting of the Liverpool City Region Combined Authority. Can all phones please be turned to silent? And can my members that uh, when you speak, you speak close to the microphones when presenting? Um, they are the best uh, acoustics in the world in this when you're in the public gallery. Uh, before we start, can I, on behalf of the Combined Authority, congratulate Asif Hamid on being awarded an MBE in the recent honours list? Congratulations for all of us. Uh, and can I also wish Warrington all the very best? Um, yes. Hopefully tonight, when they find out their fate of whether they've been chosen to be shortlisted as a future city of the future. So, I'm investing on that one too. Um, item one, are there any apologies for absence? I received apologies from Councillor Gorgel and Mayor Anderson and Councillor Gorgel and Councillor Gorgel and Councillor Gorgel. Any further apologies? No? Item two, declaration of interest, members? No? Three? Yeah, thank you, Mayor Anderson. Sorry. As well, item four, as the report sits on the board. Yeah. Any other declarations? Okay, three is the minutes of the previous meeting, which is on in mean, our court glass, which is yellow, but that, that, that court paper. Um, can I ask them to be agreed? Four is the, oh, I sign it. Four is the draft of the Liverpool John Lennon Airport Master Plan, and as people will know, International connectivity is increasingly an important function of the city region to trade effectively. The opening of the new deep water container terminal at the port of Liverpool provides new opportunities and connections. And as well as this, Liverpool John Lennon Airport plays an important role in connecting the city region internationally. The airport is consulting on its <coughs> master plan, which will take it to, to the next level. And Frank Rogers is going to briefly talk us through this. Frank. Thanks, Chair. Um, the report before you alerts members to an open consultation that's been uh, put out by Liverpool John Lennon Airport. The consultation is on its long term master plan to look to effectively manage the airport's continued growth and development. Um, we do have an issue with timing um, because of the four week deadline for this response. It's not possible for us to put a detailed and um, comprehensive response in front of the members today. So, part of the intent behind the report is to look to seek uh, delegated authority to the head of paid service in conjunction with the Metro Mer in developing and submitting the response to the airport and the combined authority, and that will be done in consultation with themselves as members of the combined authority. Some background to this, back in 2007, the airport published its master plan, which set out the plans for future development through to 2030. They now consider that it's important for them to update and review the document to look to set out the longer term ambitions that take the airport through to 2030 and indeed beyond into 2050. So as such, on 26th of June, they issued the new master plan for consultation and the response deadline is the 24th of July of this year. The, the document is freely available on the airport's website and the paper in front of you gives the web address and the link to that site. The master plan does note that the airport is a very important transport and economic asset for our city region. It is an international gateway and it currently supports about 6,000 jobs and contributes of the order of 250 million per annum to the city region economy. So in relation to that, as noted, the master plan is open for consultation. It is considered important that the authority consider the issues that are raised and develop and submit a united response given the significance of the airport to the Liverpool City region economy as a whole. However, as mentioned earlier, given the mismatch between consultation deadlines and combined authority report cycles, it's not possible to provide that initial draft response to you today. And as earlier referenced, we're looking for delegated authority to be able to finish that response as submitted by the deadline of 24th of July. Happy to take any questions that there may be. Dean, you got any initial questions? No, just to, to make the point that Frank just has that obviously um, in 10 days time we'll need to submit the response. So we're looking forward to the detailed uh, response that will be shared with everyone so we can make sure that we capture everyone's requirements and aspirations. Thank you. 
cyclical basis, we will have different presentations from a number of our uh, lead members on different thematic areas. Many things in town. I don't think we'll be guinea pig yet. Um, so I'll end up running around in hamster wheel uh, in the next five minutes. Uh, you'll know why. Um, thanks for the opportunity to just give a brief um, update on where we are with the transport portfolio. There are many things I could take you through, but the key areas I'll touch on are strategic rail issues, obviously some of the capital schemes that we're out there and delivering at the moment. Obviously, as we just uh, mentioned in the previous item, highways are key to our city region and will be key to the future success of our region, so a brief update on that. And obviously as well, the workhorse of our public transport network are bus services. Lots that we can mention about success of bus lines at this moment in time, but even more opportunely looking forward about how we'll be using some of the devolved powers that we're getting to actually take bus services on to a new, better level in the city region. In terms of strategic rail issues, one of the city region's long-term priorities has always been about ensuring the city region is fully connected to high speed rail, both north south, but crucially uh, that west east link uh, connecting us with the rest of the north. We're working very, very closely with HS2 Transport for the North and others uh, to achieve that vision. Our key focus at this moment in time is working with Transport for the North on a variety of route options to achieve that uh, link uh, from Liverpool, linking also with Warrington uh, and onto the HS2 network. And we're very much targeting September as the time when the HS2. A hybrid bill phase 2B will be published because our key target is getting passive provision for a Liverpool junction as part of that uh, parliamentary bill process. So that's developing positively and we'll keep people informed accordingly. Whilst high speed rail uh, is vital for some of our longer distance connections and freeing up more capacity, particularly for freight and how we can uh, deal with rail freight coming out of the port. Obviously, we also want to see some of the new capacity that can create used for local connectivity. One of our key focuses at the moment in time is about how we get much better links uh, to our near neighbours in Wales. So we're working very, very closely uh, with the Welsh Government around the letting of the next Wales and Borders franchise. We're hoping in August, when the specification of that franchise is announced, there will be a number of new services from Liverpool and the city region into Cheshire and Wales really to improve our connectivity uh, in that area of the conurbation and beyond. Obviously, as the Combined Authority also knows, there's lots of um, new opportunities with the brand new fleet of trains that we're buying for the Mersey Rail Network. One thing I did want to take the opportunity to update you on is only in the past couple of weeks we've signed a trial with staff of the manufacturer to actually have battery technology on those trains, giving us a great opportunity for those trains to run beyond the Mersey Rail Network onto non-electrified lines, giving us a great opportunity to go to places like Edbog Lane, Skelmsdale, like Wrexham, like Warrington, uh, beyond Hunts Cross, for example. Obviously, to make all those new services work, we need to have uh, better infrastructure and more resilient uh, infrastructure. I'm really pleased to be stood here and saying that the Wirral Slab Trap work, which was disruptive for the city region, actually was handled in the best possible way. And I'd like to thank all of our stakeholders uh, for how that was managed, in not just the way that the uh, engineering was done so seamlessly and successfully and delivered on time, but actually how the contingency transport plans worked so well to keep the city region moving. And crucially, the messaging made sure that whilst people knew it would take longer to get around, everyone knew that the city region was still open for business, so it worked really well. Learned a lot of lessons from that process, which is quite uh, fortunate, because in the next uh, few months we're going to be doing a similar process again when Lime Street has to cut close for three weeks uh, in September. So again, the same processes are in place to ensure that the engineering work is done properly. A very detailed, high-level uh, transport plan is put in place to make sure that people can get in and around the city, particularly from a further uh, distance, and crucially making sure that those media messages uh, are also in play, uh, so we get the right message that Liverpool and the city region remains fully open for business. All of that comes in a strategic approach. Three years ago, it only seems like a couple of weeks ago when uh, you blink your eyes, we launched a uh, long-term rail strategy for the city region's rail network. Uh, we always committed to constantly refreshing that to make sure it was contemporary and fit for our needs. The first refresh of that will be coming back to the combined authority in the autumn for your comments 
and endorsements to make sure that we've still got a very good strategic vision for our rail network going forward. Obviously, a number of the points I've just made link on to major transport schemes, and I'm really pleased to say that those that have been funded by the growth deal are on track. Um, it's excellent that we're stood here today to say that the work on the Hopton curve, as the name suggests, that curved piece of railway track in Hopton, actually commenced today. We've been on site and we've seen that uh, happen. Obviously, that means once that work is done in the middle of next year, we will have the potential to have direct trains from Liverpool going all the way out to North Wales, potentially even South Wales as well. So that's started and that's uh, working well. <coughs> STEP programme is also being delivered, that's a £41 million um, scheme over the next six years, really delivering a whole host of sustainable transport improvements in all six of our districts, looking at cycling, walking, uh, improvements on the bus network, and a whole host of small schemes really improving the way that people at a very local level are getting around. North Liverpool Key Corridors, uh, that scheme is underway. Many of you will have seen how Great Howard Street uh, is already being drilled at this moment in time, so delivery is happening there as well. And obviously, another key uh, project for us is around the Silver Jubilee Gateway Bridge. It's fantastic to see the progress with the brand new bridge. Obviously, to make sure that that works to its full potential, we've got to have the Silver Jubilee Bridge fully maintained to ensure that whole programme works uh, in Holton and beyond. Obviously, there's a whole host of transport schemes uh, in the SIF process, things including links to Parkside and Prestock, amongst others. That's going through the assessment process and hopefully will be coming back to the team for consideration in the coming months. That leads nicely on to strategic highways. Obviously, at the last meeting, you had a detailed update from uh, Mick where we are with the development of that key route network, so I won't repeat uh, what he said. But obviously, to deliver that network, do need to have additional funding for that. So there are a number of bits that we've put in, one with regard to the National Productivity Investment Fund for Tower Road, but also the A57, uh, and we're hoping to hear back uh, on those bits uh, shortly. And four other bits have been developed for a variety of schemes across the six districts with regard to the Highway Maintenance Challenge Fund. Uh, finally, but by no means least, uh, the bus um, services uh, approach. Obviously, you've had a previous report on the success we've had so far with the Bus Alliance, that deep partnership of working with the bus operators. It's actually seen uh, almost 10% passenger growth on our bus network. That genuinely is phenomenal because when you look around the rest of the country, bus patronage at best is flat lining in most places is declining. The fact we've been able to arrest that and get more people back on the bus locally shows we're doing something right. However, that's only the kind of beginning of our aspirations for buses. One of the very best things about the devolution deal is the brand new developed powers uh, that is bringing to us. And it's great to say that the Bus Services Act is now law. Obviously, there are a number of detailed processes we have to go through to look at the options in there and use the powers in that, but we've already kicked off the business case work that we are obliged to do. We're really looking forward to bringing back uh, the details of what has to be a strategic outline case in that business case at a point early in 2018 so we can really indicate where the future of our bus network heads. We're very positive about the opportunities within all of that. That's a bit of a brief update of all the different things uh, that happen in transport. Happy to take any questions. Thanks, Liam. Um, yeah, uh, Councillor Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Just on, on, on the 565 corridor improvements, I just my colleague to agree on that most of that actually is in South Africa. Yeah. Absolutely, that's, that's true, you know. I think it's so much better. Um, a failure of how it's bashed, you know, with the thing called North. Can we look at that? Of course we can, absolutely. Any further questions? Thanks, Liam, for that update. set the bar for the entire thing. Item 7 is the Single investment fund and our next report covers a number of investment decisions that we've been asked to make. In total, these would represent nearly £5.9 million pounds of investment to secure economic growth. And Dale Wilburn will take us through this. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the report today before you is seeking approval to four full business case applications. It's also seeking delegated approval for their paid service in consultation with the Mayor to be able to endorse the progression of future outline business case submissions through to four business case stage. 
four projects are the Centre of Excellence in Infectious Disease Research, or CDEP for short. This project is led by the Liverpool School for Tropical Medicine and is seeking a capital grant of 1.78 million. This will support the creation of a new laboratory and collaboration space within the accelerated building here in the Liverpool City Centre. Some 88 net additional jobs and 16.2 million pounds of GPA forecast. Mersey Reach is a project led by developer Charles <coughs> Gate and will result in an initial phase of commercial development on a strategic site from the Lundsbridge Road in Sefton. The site has recently received planning consent from Sefton and the applicant forecasts that once fully developed, the site has the potential to create over 350 net additional jobs. The initial phase of development for which SIF funding is sought will see some 123,000 square foot of floor space created and deliver a net annual GBA of 7.5 million. The capital grant in the sum of 1.145 million is recommended. Venus 210, a proposed 218,000 square foot speculative manufacturing distribution warehouse on local business park. The project is led by Flint Rock and is seeking a capped capital grant of 750,000 pounds. It is estimated that 172 net additional jobs will be created and a GBA of 14.28 million. The final project, the Liverpool City Region Film Content Fund. This project is led by the Liverpool Film Office and is seeking a capital grant of £2 million, together with £200,000 of revenue support. The project will see the expansion of the Film Office services across the whole of the city region, together with the establishment of a £2 million content fund aimed at attracting key production and facilities companies. The GBA of £64 million is forecast along with 270 net additional jobs. All of the projects have been independently appraised and are considered to have a good strategic fit and represent value for money and are recommended for approval. The recommendations are set out on page 49. Thanks, Dale. Can we agree the recommendations are set out on page 49? Agreed. Um, item 8, it's another portfolio. It's an update on business and Brexit and I see if will take us through this particular presentation. nationally and internationally. 
going to have one voice, we're going to have a unified approach for this. It's going to be, it's going to be clear, it's going to be concise. What is our offer as a city region? And actually, we've got to sit back and question ourselves what is our offer for a number of years? We've got to be clear on the offer. We've got to work in conjunction with the universities, the education, the businesses, the local authorities, the combined authorities, sorry, the combined authorities, but also with other business operations throughout the city. It's not one single person's job. This is the job of the industry, but also the other people outside of the universities and the other organisations. So we've got to start working together. Something we've not been very good at, to be very honest with you. It's something we've got to start doing a lot more about. Business finance is so much out there. You know, if you're a business guy, you're actually looking at what you're doing here. It's a mishmash of information out there. I think we've got to bring it all together. Because without bringing it together, we're not going to attract right in with investment. So we're going to be more strategic on this. We're going to say to people out there, actually, what have we got? Where do we go for help? Help them business support. I think that's one of the key areas to look at. Broad sectors, um, it's, it's, it's difficult to say where we're going to have a single broad sector. You know, somebody said, you know, 46 percent of the jobs are going to be created in the next five years, but not even started in business today. So when you look at digital, you look at creative, Look at the SIA, you know, the science and innovation. That's where we're going to be looking. At. So that's the new era. It's the digital, it's the creative. We've got to start looking at some of these areas and say, how do we capitalise on what's out there? And some of the great assets we've got here as well. <coughs> Business engagement. Um, again, we've got to get a structured and inclusive approach on this. We've got to start working. You know, we've got nine sector boards here. We have at our fingertips the ability to talk to a lot of the small. A lot of the SMEs and a lot of the players in the city region. We've got to start utilising these people. So the best people to tell us what's wrong with business and business, the best people to sell our business and services are the business people. But actually we're not utilising them. <coughs> so what we've got to do, we've got to start utilising these people. Um, we will start in August after um, a lot of consultations, start launching a business inside program, which will give us more deal with a raft of issues for business people. So we'll actually have Things talking about internationalisation, talking about intelligence, talking about digitalisation, um, and also you know, impacts about what Brexit is going to do for us. So we're going to start to launch that in August. We're going to have a lot of business people there. But we're also going to involve and get inclusive with the other business areas around it. So it's a key area. So that's going to start from August. We're just putting a plan together, which will hopefully release probably in the next eight to twelve weeks, where we'll have a number of business advisors, but not just nationally, but international business people coming to these events telling us what we should do differently and how we should do it. Um, business festival, I think there's a, a number of discussions, but you know we've got to try and evaluate this. What what is it really bringing to the city region? But also what is it offering to our city region players? So it's very good at having the international festival. You know the, the Brexit is actually creating as well as risks and uncertainty, it's creating opportunities as well. So we have to really encompass and say how can we make the best for what we've got this is a great opportunity. I think we've got to measure it correctly. We've got to define what it's going to do. And the outcomes are going to be there. You know, it's great to do an international festival. It's great to do events. But actually, what, what is the end result? So I think we've got to measure it a little bit differently. Um, Brexit, I think Steve gave me this because nobody else wanted it. Um, <laughs> I think um, not even government wanted it, to be honest with you. So what do you want me to say on Brexit? I think when I, when I look at Brexit, um, I hear something different every day. So. Um, I think we are where we are, I keep saying that, but I think we have to we have to look at how it affects our city region. I think we, we are with the universities, you know, there's a lot of things we need to do. We need to lobby some of the stuff which is going to affect us differently. So when we look at tier three, we look at tier one big pieces, which is our students here, we're coming to the city region, our universities, we've really got to start knocking on the door. We've got to have something that's different for us. And I'm not saying, you know, the city region should separate itself from everybody else. But we should look at the key areas where it's going to affect us. And actually go back and lobby through this organisation here, through our Metro Bet, go back and lobby for things we can do differently because I think we have to, we have to do that, that we, you know, there's got to be some massive changes in our city. And I think, you know, when we talk about the export, we talk about the labour force and also the imports, we've got to work out who's actually exporting, who's doing well, who's doing well in imports, and bring them together in a collaboration. We've got a lot of information through the universities, Colleges, which we've got to bring together and say actually we've 
we've got to really look at what our opportunities are about Brexit, but also what our risks are to be frank to the point. So I think when we talk about Brexit, it's, it's quite an open thing, you know, the next, next six to 12 months we keep it. But, you know, as I said right at the beginning, the asset of the business portfolio is, is a consideration of everybody working together. I mean, I've, I've run through these slides very quickly because I was talking about five minutes ago. But, you know, there is so much in there. The only way this is going to be successful, the only way the city region is going to be successful, um, you know, I've said it numerous times, is the collaboration. <laughs> collaborative approach between all the city regional leaders, all the business units, all the universities and colleges. So success is not down to one individual or one individual portfolio. Success is down to the collaborative approach. And we've got to be really open and honest to the city regions and say that we're better. Any questions for the city? No? Thanks so much for your presentation. Uh, and last but certainly not least, we've got a, another portfolio update on health children services and adult services that Andy makes his way to give us his presentation.
And this, this was to drive some of them uh, market demands out the window and get some even more efficiencies out of them. Uh, working again with our communities and the players, that's the fact. And for me, it's, it's not just about that, it's a whole system of culture. I think that's it, just mentioned some of that. It's, that it's, it's everything we do, it's, it's a whole wraparound service that we're trying to deliver. And I'm not talking about that. But when we talk sort of about skills and training and opportunities, that, that fulfills that. If you look at the background of that, I think, I think the ZBA for the, for the health economy, since the business time, of 4.5 million quid. So it's a massive amount of money that we can pay tax for. Again, I want to work with the NHS. I think we should work with the NHS. We've had various meetings with them. Um, some of them have been good meetings, and some of them, to be honest with you, have been very poor. But we need to tie for that. I've been talking to the College of St. Thomas yesterday, and we're looking at the uh, Looking at the, the footprints, how we want to engage better with our CCTs, how we, how we actually want to drive that forward. But some of the numbers that you can bring out of that, we want to enable people to stay home for longer, because that's the, that's the good benefit to them and to us as a service We've got around about 30, 38 million pounds in the fishes that we can possibly get out of the new schemes anyway, but they can't afford them. We want to reduce the rest of the replacements by at least 30%, less than the replacement by. 10%. They're just figures that we're working towards at this point in time. I'd like to increase them, please. But it's about learning the, the, the lessons and it's about, again, it's actually, I think it's worth it. It's about the collaboration structure. So we've got to get that collaboration together. I think with the uh, well, last two years since I've been a leader, is that we're starting to talk more and more as local authorities. We're starting to understand this individual's point of view and where we're going with it. And more importantly, I think we're starting to get to hang on. We're all on the same bus. That's what we need to do. I think that's pretty much all I've got to say. I'm not answering any questions today because we'll be <laughs> <laughs> But I will say this, the next time we come I want to pick another direction because children's services is absolutely another massive piece of work. And I want to pay a little bit of tribute to colleagues that are doing that now. Uh, Liverpool and again Stephanie colleagues are well over time away to it and agree with where we we can join, uh, join up them services. And I'm a person that would fill the fill out and we've offered out to, to Will because we've been in that position before, for example. And that again is about that collaborative approach. It's not one person talking to one person, it's all our problem. Thanks, colleagues. Thanks, Andy. Excellent. Um, has there been a question? We're on to public question time. <laughs> <laughs> um, Item 10, and we've received a question from Dr. Jeffrey Woodcock from the Men's Commonwealth Democracy. Can I invite Dr. Woodcock to address this, please? We are a local group of Unlocked Democracy, a national cross-party and no-party organisation which campaigns for constitutional voting and political reform. We are writing with regard to the Liverpool City Region Combined Authority Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Their last meeting was 25th of January this year and their next meeting is the 26th of July. 2017, which is currently provisional, which is a period of six months. We would like to question why the Overview and Scrutiny Committee has not had a meeting since the 25th of January. Throughout this period, the LCRCA Cabinet, chaired by the Mayor and Mayor Steve Rotherham, um, since his election on May the 4th, it has met monthly. The Overview and Scrutiny Committee was scheduled to meet every three months. The LCR Mayor and LCRCA Cabinet have substantial powers, functions and responsibilities. And the Overview and Scrutiny Committee function is to scrutinise them and to hold them to account as critical friends. We quote below the Constitution of the LCRCA Part 3C Overview and Scrutiny Committee. I don't think there's any reason for me to read that. You've got it in front of you. So finally, further, our question is to, in paragraph two above, if the Overview and Scrutiny Committee is to carry out its functions effectively, it should meet at least every three months, and we would suggest 
that this committee should meet every two months. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Woodcock. And as you know, that you will receive a full written response within 10 working days. But um, as you asked the question, there's some issues that we can uh, deal with today. Sue Jarvis is going to provide you with a, an immediate response. Thank you, Chair. Um, just, just in terms of a response, the, the scrutiny panel completed its programme of business for the 2016-17 year at its meeting of the 25th of January. And that was having completed its final review of the year, which was into apprenticeships. Following the election of the Metro Mayor, the scrutiny panel has now been reconstituted with new members, and the membership has been extended to 20. The constituent councils have now completed their appointment processes to the new panel, and we have an induction meeting for the scrutiny panel members next Wednesday. Following on from that, I can confirm the annual meeting is on the 26th of July where the work programme for 2017-18 and the frequency of meetings will be determined. Thank you for your question. Uh, item 11 is petitions and statements, and we've had, had a statement uh, for today's meeting, and we'll invite uh, Mr. William Shortall to present his statement. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank the Metro Mayor and the Cabinet for this opportunity. Um, uh, this is a statement about uniform to of access to website information with regards to citizens with disabilities across the city region, the law authority websites, and about the disability confident employer status scheme. Uh, I in short, would like to take this up uh, to make this statement in a personal capacity on behalf of disabled citizens in the local city region. In the 1960s, Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones sang about how a man on the TV out there told him how white his shirt should be in a song, I Can't Get No Satisfaction. Well, in 2017, on the internet, we have Kendall Jenner on Instagram telling me how white my teeth should be, but I still can't get no satisfaction when it comes to disabilities and equality points of contact information. When the Disability Discrimination Act 1995 was enacted, each local authority eventually had a dedicated disability access officer. This role has now been delegated into another person's job description or as another part of another person's duties. As the DDA 1995 Act was incorporated into the Qualities Act 2010 and is now part of the nine protected characteristics. However, not everyone knows this and lots of old terminology is still used on the internet, leading to frustration and wasted time and uh, of efforts by citizens when looking for accurate, useful and quick information without being commercialised and exploited by third party information providers using commercial marketing techniques to sell other products. I would ask that the Metro Mayor enables or requires that the local, uh, the local combined uh, regional authority, local uh, authority, facilitate the following: that the LCR LAs, the quality officers, and construction and facilities management officers, as well as all the interested third party stakeholders, meet together with the objective of agreeing a uniformity on the names and explaining the responsibilities on their web page of their website that is congruent across the LCR so that the citizens of the LCR can be pointed to the correct uh, point of contact information without the need to leave the LCR LA webpage. I appreciate that most, if not all, of the LCR LAs have access to disability information via disabilitygo.com. Um, that's, that's a private company called uh, Disable Enable Limited. Uh, and I welcome that information. It does not remove, however, the duty, in my opinion, to give accurate point of contact information of the subject in question from all the LCR LA's websites to avoid confusion by search engines and the uh, LCR citizens in different LA's. So, uh, so if a person is uh, looking for point of contact information, it should be the same across all of them, uh, including email.